I think uh, when you start as a poet, it really uh, makes you aware of how few words, how few words are really needed to uh, to bring ideas uh, from one mind to another. So uh, just the experience of, 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 of writing poetry uh, from a very young age, uh, I think, uh, I think that is uh, the reason I use few words. I, I simply, uh, 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 I simply uh, let's say, uh, honed those tools more than uh, the sprawling story. But I like sometimes to 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 take the take the take the uh, to to fill a bucket full of words and and, and mm -hmm. throw it onto the page. And I think I do it in the book Tus Marke Unre, which for me was an experiment in uh, letting words flow instead of restricting them. And I'm really a true believer in the processing power of the reader. So I really like to let the reader do the work. So by giving just the minimum amount of words, the reader will have sp space in his own or her own mind to expand it. The Icelandic sagas are written in, 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 in very few words. They can be big, but uh, the vocabulary, for example, is, is quite small. Yes. And they are very direct and uh, and, uh, and uh, for example, if nothing happened during the winter between two uh, big events, they will just say the winter passed. And then they continue with the story. So you learn these things. And, and I think it's right that I, I learned also something from reading the folk stories, because the folk stories are always very compact. They are really like anecdotes. And, uh, and uh, I like to bring together, actually, many different but small anecdotes and see what happens when they rub up against one another. So even though I'm using few words, I think I'm using, let's say, uh, different textures within the same book. So in the same book, like uh, Maunastet or, or Monistin, uh, you have few pages, you have few words, but I think you have quite many different textures in the language and in, in the way the story is told. I can speed up the story very fast, mm. I can slow it down, I can use dialogue, I can use a text that pretends to be uh, uh, an article from a journal, I, 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 I use two poems, you know. So within 140 pages, I think you get very varied use of language even though it's not many words. At the, at the very last moment, uh, I, in a way, hand the reader the keys. A new key, yes. A new key, key yes. to why this book was written. And that is a very new thing for me, to actually step forward as a real yes. character and, and with information about my own life. But I thought in this case it would, would be uh, very important for the reader to get a little glimpse into what urgency lies behind mm -hmm. this story and what reality lies behind it. And I think it heightens the sense of reality of the fictional world uh, in, in, a, in a new way. And it was a big step for me to, 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 to do it. And it simply came from uh, the historical facts. Uh, my great-grandfather died in the leprosy hospital in Reykjavik in 1933 and I realized that the fictional world and uh, my family story they they met but at the same time I didn't want them to meet I didn't want the character uh, in the book uh, to meet my real life grandfather because there is there is a difference between those two realities so they almost meet and, uh, and uh, this is maybe the place where literature happens. It's in this almost encounter of reality and the fictional reality. I, I, I think there are always uh, several reasons for uh, uh, any choice in, 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 in writing. 
uh, it's very difficult to say, oh, I, I decided to do this because of that one thing. Um, when I started uh, 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 considering the days of the Spanish flu uh, as a background for a story, uh, I realized that I needed a character that was somehow detached from what was happening. And uh, one of the first ideas was that, that the character would be interested in what is impossible during the days of a plague, and that is sex. That is physical contact in uh, uh, an environment where physical contact uh, has become deadly and nobody wants it anymore. So I started looking for somebody who wanted to have sex during the days of the Spanish flu. And uh, I also started looking for somebody who did not have the same emotional involvement in what was happening as the main population, you know, where whole families were suffering and dying. I was really looking for an outsider to carry the story. And, uh, and uh, when I started looking, lo lo looking at what kind of uh, a sex story uh, I could uh, place uh, uh, in, that, in that deadly environment, uh, I realized that if I really wanted my character to be on the outskirts of, of society, I did not want a prostitute. I did not want to write a, a story about a female prostitute because she would just have said no. She would have just closed her shop, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, everybody has had enough of badly written uh, heterosexual uh, sex scenes anyway in literature. So I thought, if he's gay, all of a sudden everything comes together. He, 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 his sexuality has pushed him to the, to the, to, to the, to the outskirts of society. Uh, 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 it's very obvious why he is cut off from his, from his, uh, from his, uh, from from those who are buying sex from him when 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 the plague start, starts going. So it was it was a choice. It was a very it, it was very much a literary choice, but up. But obviously, the moment I, I decided that the guy was queer and, uh, and, and was prostituting himself, I realized that I had a story that had a strain, uh, strong, let's say, strong resonance uh, 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 through all the decades between our days and the days of the story. The reason Icelandic literature uh, is strong and has uh, kept alive, you know, kept, kept, been kept, uh, why it has been kept alive uh, as, a, as, a, as a strong literature is uh, our uh, ease with absorbing foreign influence. All of the great uh, moments in Icelandic literature uh, are uh, marked by a strong uh, dialogue with foreign literature or foreign culture. I think there is no doubt that the sagas are, were written because the Nordic culture and the, and the, and the, and the Celtic culture came together in, 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 in the population. The greatest poets of the 19th century were only great because they were importing the German romantic ideals and new poetry forms. Mm -hmm. so, that's our, our literary history is the literary history of, of di a dialogue with, with foreign, foreign literatures and cultures. I think the Nordic spirit doesn't only lie in the language. I think the Nordic spirit lies in, uh, in, in uh, shared ideals. And, uh, and uh, the language that is spoken should not be the defining factor. And of course, we don't know which languages will be spoken in the north uh, in, in the years to come. It's possible that in Iceland, in 100 years' time, you will have a language that is, let's say, 50% Icelandic, 30% Polish, 1% Thai, with a little bit of Spanish from the Filipinos thrown in, you know? 
we don't know. We don't know how the languages will evolve. There was a break in the Nordic languages in the, in the old times, which meant that all of a sudden the Icelandic sagas became closed books to the rest of the North, you know. I don't think we would need to go back to that time. So I think, you know, languages are moving on, they are changing all the time, but we should stick to the ideals and speak about them in whatever language is available to us.